to afford our speaker all the time, except for the introduction time, of course. So welcome, uh, everybody, to today's, I think this is the second in our series in Frontiers in Biomedical Research Seminar series. Uh, as everybody knows, the last 12 hours, we have lots of speakers here and a lot of programs, so it's an exciting couple days here uh, at the VTC. Anyway, it's a real pleasure uh, to introduce today's uh, speaker, Dr. Erica Olmos sapphire um, She, uh, by the way, was scheduled to give a talk here last spring, I think, and uh, a few fires got in her way and uh, couldn't make it. Um, as you may recall, there were some pretty serious fires out on the West Coast. And so uh, she very graciously agreed to reschedule and come out this fall. So I, I think we're very fortunate to have that. And, and for those of you who are familiar with her work and kind of know what's going on in the world, you know, over the last few months has been a very um, important and busy time for people doing the kind of work she does in which she's a preeminent figure. And so I'm especially grateful that she was able to come out now with all the other stuff going on in her life scientifically and uh, getting the word out to the public about the work she does. So uh, basically, uh, I just want to give you a quick overview. Um, uh, Dr. Olmos Sapphire did her undergraduate work at Rice University in Houston uh, and then went on to the Scripps uh, Research Institute as a graduate student where she did her PhD in molecular biology, uh, stayed on to do postdoctoral training in immunology at Scripps. And uh, the folks there at some point uh, realized what a good thing they had uh, having somebody like her there and uh, enabled her and invited her to join the faculty at Scripps where she uh, was initially an assistant professor and is now, of course, professor of immunology and microbial science. Um, Dr. Olman Sapphire has received a number of awards and recognition for uh, her work. I won't list them all, but a couple I think are worth mentioning. Early on in her career, she received uh, the outstanding uh, award for outstanding contributions to crystallography. Uh, she received an Ellison Medical Foundation Award um, in Global Infectious Disease and a Burroughs Welcome uh, Foundation Award, a Career Award. Uh, she also received the Presidential uh, Early Career Award in Science and Technology that I think many of you have heard about. It's a very prestigious award. And just this past year was elected as a fellow of the uh, Academy of Microbiology, I think just in the last few months perhaps. Um, she, she's also very engaged uh, globally in her research collaborations and takes leadership roles in many of those things, including uh, serving on the uh, Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Immunotherapies Consortium. She's director of that particular program. And she's also on the scientific leadership board for the Global uh, Virus Network. Uh, she serves on editorial boards of a number of journals, I uh, won't go through them, but including annual reviews of virology and co-edits the current opinion series on emerging uh, infections. Um, her work has uh, been characterized, I think, by a, a tremendous uh, combined technical and insightful conceptual approaches to think about um, these, these families of viruses and how they work and their life cycle and potential strategies for for getting at them. Um, she has used crystallography, uh, structural approaches to do really seminal work, uh, looking at uh, things like uh, the Marburg virus, where she's uh, looked at the VP24 protein uh, and showed the commonalities between that and Ebola virus in terms of the assembly function of these proteins, for example. Um, she's also uh, demonstrated, uh, I think elegantly, and I, I love the word plasticity whenever I hear it, about a single polypeptide uh, and a highly uh, plastic role, the VP40 protein, that I think she was the first to show was actually a, a dimer uh, functionally, they've been argued in a monomer, and then uh, purified this dimer and went on to do the uh, crystallographic work and showed its importance and how a, a rather limited number of genes, if you will, I, I think my virus friends, including you, are going to get really mad I said that, but anyway, how a small number of genes can, can lead to an incredibly rich repertoire in terms of the different functions of these polypeptides and, and viruses which I think is very, very important and interesting work. Um, she's, she's demonstrated the Ebola virus uh, can actually avoid the innate immune response um, and uh, very important for thinking about uh, binding with double-stranded RNA recognition. Uh, and she's been involved with some really exciting work on the side of antibodies for neutralizing uh, antibodies uh, and learning about um, the relationship of the antibodies with higher and, low affini and lower affinity um, to these binding sites on the virus and how that can be used as strategies for thinking about interfering with the virus. So all said, um, in terms of the hemorrhagic uh, f viruses and fevers, uh, her work is, is, is fundamental in understanding the biology. Uh, the structural biology is, is elegant, and uh, the importance, I think, is clear to everybody. So it's a, a real honor to have her here today, and please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Olmos Sapphire. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So I thought I'd tell you two stories today. Uh, one, because it's newsworthy, the ZMAT cocktail. You 
seen in the news. Another one because it's science, the assembly and egress. It's published, but it, it just makes so much more sense when you see it in person than when you try to read it on a flat. So we work on all kinds of bad things in our lab. Um, a lot of what we work on is Ebola virus. This is the first picture ever taken of Ebola virus. The guy didn't know he had Ebola virus. I don't think he was wearing gloves when he took the picture. It's a long filamentous virus and just it's flexible, adopts whatever shape it falls onto the EM grid on. It causes fever, hemorrhage, shock, death not too long after infection. And uh, it only has seven genes. And of course, there's many more than seven functions in the virus life cycle. So one of the themes of my lab is how do you get so much pathogenesis from what is essentially a handful. So two stories today. The first one is entry, the start of the virus life cycle. This is a cartoon of the Ebola virus, long filamentous virus, membrane envelope. The virus only has one molecule that it puts on its surface, a glycoprotein called GP. So GP is all it has to find a new target, we call it a target cell, or a cell that it wants to infect, attach and drive itself in. So it's the only protein that does that. So that's embedded in the membrane. Underneath it's a layer called the matrix, and then the nucleocapsid that bears the viral genome at the center. So GP is what drives entry of the cell it wants to infect. And then GP is organized like this. So here's its long polypeptide sequence. It's cleaved in the, we call it the producer cell. That's the cell that's infected, that's bumping out viruses. Cleaved here by furin to make two subunits, a GP1 and a GP2. GP1 is what drives attachment to a new cell. GP2 is the machinery that drives it into the cell. So GP1 has a receptor binding domain. GP2 has heptad repeats. So like all type 1 viruses, HIV, flu, whatever, it undergoes a big conformational change from a spring-loaded viral surface structure into a much more stable six helix bundle as it fuses the virus and host membranes together. That's this piece of machinery. And then Ebola has something weird. It has a mucin-like domain in the GP1. And this is about 150 amino acids, um, up to 20 O-link sugars and five N-link sugars. And it's predominantly disordered. There's very little secondary structure. So it's a big, heavily glycosylated thing in the middle. OK. Three of those come together to make a pretty big spike on the viral surface. It's 450 kilodaltons in size. This is the first crystal structure we saw this. It took five years to figure out how to get this 450 kilodalton thing, which is 50% carbohydrate, into crystals. To do that, we had to cut off that mucin-like domain. We'll get back to that in a second. So, but this is the core of the molecule. Uh, the receptor binding GP1 subunits are in blue and green. And then the GP2, the fusion machinery, is in white. And it ties the molecule together, kind of wraps around the outside of the spider. So viral glycoprotein have what's called, called a fusion peptide. It's a hydrophobic peptide that's what penetrates the target cell membrane to drive it in. And you think a hydrophobic peptide would be something that's hidden inside the molecule and comes back out. Well, that's what happens for flu. But for Ebola, it's different. It's slapped onto the outside of the molecule like a fly swatter. So somehow an infection, this is the spring-loaded viral surface structure. After receptor binding and some other triggers, the fusion peptide unwraps and drives itself into the target cell membrane and then fuses the virus membrane and the host membrane. So that's the core of what it looks like in the viral surface. There is a subdomain that turns out to be important. We call it the glycan cap. It's the outer chunk of each GP1. And we call it the glycan cap because it has four N-linked sugars attached all in the same spot. Outside of the glycan cap are those mucin-like domains. Each of these is 75 kilodaltons. They're attached up there. We had to cut them off to get the molecule to crystallize. But we were interested in what the real viral surface GP looked like in all its fully glycosylated glory. We can't crystallize anything bearing that domain, so we turn to small angle X-ray scattering, just shining X-rays and proteins tumbling about in solution. It's not a high resolution technique, maybe it's nine or 10 angstroms resolution, but you can get a sense of its molecular envelope, and that's shown here. So this is the core we crystallized, and these three giant blobs are the mucin-like domains. Now, take this with a grain of salt. I think Sachs is seeing some of the flexibility. This is a mobile domain, it's probably half this wide, I think it certainly can reach out to this long, because very, we get a very clear radius of gyration of 250 angstrom for the spike. What we can learn from this is the mucin domains are big and hairy, and they're up there. And they kind of dominate the structure of the molecule, right? Adding those domains doubles the size of what the thing is on the viral surface. 
So that's what it looks like on the viral surface. A lot of that's carbohydrate. But here's the tricky thing. The job of this protein is to attach and drive itself into human cells. This version of the protein on the viral surface cannot do that. This molecule is not competent for receptor bindings. A bull is very odd. Instead, what happens is that it goes into the cell by macropenocytosis and is initially captured by interaction with the viral membrane or by interaction of any one of a number of lectins with all that sugar. So there's nothing that's necessary and sufficient on the cell surface because you knock out any one of those lectins, there's another one that does the same job. So it just gets itself into the endosome. In the endosome, it's cleaved by human enzymes called cathepsins. And the job of the cathepsins is to do this, which is to lop off those mucin-like domains and the glycan cap, leaving something that looks like that, leaving the core in the endosome. So I'm not making that up. That's now the crystal structure we just solved of the cleaved uh, viral glycoprotein. So we see a couple new things. One thing we see is nothing new. The cleavage doesn't change its conformation. All it does is lop off that carbohydrate. So it's like you have a giant oak tree, and it says cut off all the branches and leaves and left the trunk. The trunk is what binds receptor. So there's no major conformational change. You just cut all stuff off. We see the GP1, GP2 disulfides anchor the molecule together at the bottom. Those were previously, previously disordered. And we see the receptor binding site. Now, based on the mutagenesis, we think the receptor binds there, up on that top, something that was hidden underneath the glycan cap. So I surf. This is a wave. <laughs> Waves, we don't get ones that are quite this. This is probably Hawaii. Waves have a crest and a trough, and you try to ride this part, unless you're dragging your nose in the sand from having wiped out. That's what this NPC1 binding site looks to, like to me. There's a crest and a trough. So the crest has a series of lysines, and together they are essential for interaction with receptor. A lot of this mutagenesis was done by Judy White at UVA. And then it has this hydrophobic trough, and the residues down in here that are also essential for entry. And until we understood that this protein was cleaved and this site was exposed, it really wasn't understood why. It was thought that the reason an F88 mutation knocked out infectivity was because it destroyed the structure, but in fact, we think there's an important contact. We think this surface is an initial electrostatic capture of receptor and then it binds hydrophobic residues in there. So this is what the molecule looks like on the surface of the virus. That's the version of it that's subject to antibody surveillance. This is what the molecule looks like inside the endosome. That's the version that's competent for receptor binding. So it's one polypeptide, but it winds up being two very different functional manifestations of the peptide. So what does that mean for the immune response? Nothing good. So you can see how a lot of stuff is clipped off between here and there. Now, I've drawn it as a blue cloud, but there's protein, there's carbohydrate. Those domains can be immunodominant, and what the antibodies are seeing are linear stretches of polypeptide between the sugars. You can generate a lot of antibodies against all those domains, but, and they can bind with nanomolar affinity, but the whole virus antibody complex is drawn into the endosome where the human, endo the human enzymes cut it all right off, leaving a perfectly functional receptor binding core. So the human enzymes just clip off whatever antibodies you come up with against it. And then what you'd really want to hit, say that conserved essential receptor binding site in the wave trough at the top, is not exposed in the viral surface. It's directly underneath that glycan cap in the mucin-like domain. So an antibody would be great against that site, but you never elicit them because that site's never exposed. And even if you manage to engineer this and immunize antibodies against it, they don't bind the viral surface. So that's a bit of a challenge. And the question is, well, what's going to work? There are different ways you can ask the question of what works. One way you can ask it is what blocks virus entry. Another way you can ask it is what neutralizes. So neutralization in virology is the ability of something to prevent the virus from infecting the cell. This is an antibody that neutralizes. So this is the crystal structure of the core. In yellow are two FAB fragments from a human antibody from a survivor of the 1995 kikwit zayer outbreak. The antibody is called KZ52. And you see what it does is it hasn't targeted the top. It gets locked off. It binds the bottom of the spike. Now there's about 30 more residues that come down here before the transmembrane domain. They're disordered. So there's a bit more of a stalk. 
What this thing does is it kind of anchors the blue and white together. And we don't have a fusion assay in this field, but we think what this antibody does is lock that protein machinery together so the fusion loop can't come off and um, penetrate the target cell. So we think that's what it's doing. It's binding the base. So that was a crystal structure we had in 2008. What, another question, well, what, what other antibodies are there that neutralize? Well, we saw this structure. This is Sudan virus. It's also in the Ebola virus genome. It's a little bit less lethal. It causes the other half of the outbreaks. We saw this GPN complex with an antibody that the army raised by immunizing mice with Sudan, inactivated Sudan variants. That antibody is called 16F6. This is the only antibody known to neutralize Sudan virus. It also binds the base. And essentially, it does the same thing. So if you superimpose them, you can see that the white, I mean the yellow, and the orange antibodies, although they come from different angles, they attack the same spot. They anchor the GP1 to the GP2. So the orange antibody came from an immunized mouse in a lab. The yellow antibody came from a human that survived an outbreak, but the different kinds of antibodies have found the same sort of solution. Now, 16F6 has not been tried in primates yet, but KZ52 has. Now, KZ52 neutralized the virus brilliantly in test tubes. It protected mice from lethal, we call it viral challenge, that's lethal exposure, protected guinea pigs. It did not protect the primates. The primates given KZ52 all died. So that was in 2007, and that was the best antibody we had against Ebola virus. And this was kind of a dark day. People started to wonder if any antibody at all would protect against Ebola virus. If this best one we have doesn't save the primates, perhaps this is an unsolvable problem. A lethal dose for the primates can be one virus particle. So it's a very tall order to ask an antibody to scrub this all out. Obviously, you need immune control and you need T cell control. But the best thing we had didn't work. And a lot of people in the field shifted their attention entirely to, well, antibodies are not the solution here. We need T cell control. We need this. We need that. And it was very difficult to get any support to keep working on antibodies. But a few years later, the field found, and this is now multiple labs doing the same thing independently, that this one antibody didn't work, but mixtures of antibodies would. So the first study was that polyclonal IgG could protect primates. So polyclonal is just the whole mishmash of whatever it is in the sera. A cocktail of two antibodies put together give you partial protection. A different group put three together and got complete protection. That cocktail is called MB003. Still another group put a different three antibodies together and also got complete protection. It's called ZMAB. OK, that was before exposure. What about later? There are two different scenarios in which someone could be exposed to Ebola virus. One is you know you have because you're doing an autopsy and you cut yourself, or you're a scientist and you suck yourself in the needle lab. Another one's an accident. You just are sick and you don't realize you have been in contact with the wrong bat in the wrong cave. Or you're a doctor and you're in full PPE and one day you have a fever and you don't know what day you were exposed because you've been treating Ebola patients for a long time. They wondered if these therapies could be useful in that kind of scenario once disease has already onset. And they can. MB003 gave partial protection even when the primates had progressed to at least two major symptoms, the high fever and a high viral load. And that's pretty good because otherwise there was zero protection. So partial was a success. And then a bit later, a new cocktail called ZMAP, well, I'll show you, was able to give complete protection even when the primates had progressed very late in the disease course. Okay, so these mixtures of antibodies work. These are brilliant. This is a really good hope because we know how to manufacture antibodies. We know how to manufacture a lot of antibodies. We know they're going to work. They're generally safe. Um, it's a great emergency idea. So we've been solving structures of glycoproteins and antibodies and trying to understand how they work. So this is the first set we got. This is the Army's cocktail. Eight of three antibodies put together. Two are against the mucin-like domain. And so we solve structures of the fab bound to the peptides between the glycans. This one, now this is now a single particle EM. So the glycoprotein is the kind of the light blue in the bottom, and the FAB or the gray at the top. It binds the top, it binds the glycan cap. So these three put together give you protection. But here's the odd thing. They're mucin, mucin, glycan cap. Every single one of these epitopes and the antibodies bound to them are lopped right off the virus once it gets into the endosome. And none of these neutralize. So if you're using neutralization in vitro as your assay to pick out antibodies, you never would have come up with these if they were protective. 
So we have this combination, which protects the animal, but doesn't which neutralizes, but doesn't protect. So why is that? Is it that that solution is wrong? You kind of see that trend, right? One anima didn't give you any protection, two put together gave you some, and the two times somebody tried three, you got complete protection before exposure. Now, obviously, there's, you know, there's all kinds of other layers of complexity, but it does seem like more could be better. But how do you choose the more? So the first answer is, is, is it just that you needed a, three things stuck together? Is it three? Maybe four would be even better than three. Maybe if you picked the right two, that would work. How many should animals should go into this cocktail? And which ones are best? Obviously, we didn't know. If, if we had thought about it, we wouldn't have chosen those three against the mucin and the glycan cap, but they seem to work. So how, what assay do we use to figure out which animals are going to work? You can't start in primates. You've got to start somewhere else. And if you're putting things together in a cocktail, Surely they should be complementary in some way. They should be additive. It would be great if they were, had some kind of synergistic effect. So we certainly don't want them to compete with each other. So how would you even choose this cocktail? What experiments would you do? So this kind of looked like a complex problem with those with nested sets of questions. And a lot of these are basic research questions. We don't know what kind of antibody is going to be useful. We don't know what assay we would do to figure it out. And one problem we had is that we had an N of four. So we couldn't really draw a lot of conclusions from one set of three that worked for some reason and one that didn't for some reason. What we really needed was a significant sample size. And so I had an idea, and the field got behind it, which is to form the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Immunotherapeutic Consortium. So it's 25-plus labs across seven countries doing one single study. Whoops, I'm going to go back. Where everybody in the field is throwing all their anti-Ebola antibodies into one big pot. We're going to blind them all, compare them side by side. And the idea of blinding them is that everyone agrees on what the data is, right? Just X neutralizes and doesn't protect antibody. Y neutralizes and does protect. What's the difference? Everybody can agree on what is working and why, and nobody knows whose antibodies are whose. So it's field-wide, open collaboration. The data is going to be on the website, so anybody can track where their samples are. They don't know who's or whose. They're all blinded. And we're going to try to figure out all the basic research questions and what makes the right cocktail. And when we set this program up, we thought there are two ways you could go about doing this. Now, you know the old fable of the tortoise and the hare, and ultimately the tortoise won. But right now, the hare is looking pretty good. We had two ideas on how we would do this. One track, the tortoise track, we take everybody's antibodies. We've got 150 right now. We blind them all, so nobody knows what they are. There's just antibodies, one through 150. We solve structures of them all. Now, I'm not going to crystallize 150 things. That's not going to happen. So we're doing single particle. Um, negative stain E and just to get a broad sense of where, what kinds of places they bind in the glycoprotein. We're correlating all those structures to in all the different in vitro assays we have of neutralization, budding, binding, to try to figure out what works. All of them are going to go into mice. So we're able to finally correlate what works and why. Could we have figured out from some in vitro assay what's going to work in vivo, and if not, why not, and what are we looking at, and can we bin these antibodies in different categories to try to put ones together? And at the end of this, we thought we might get the best antibody cocktail the world can come up with. Certainly, we're going to get something which is going to be a research benchmark for any new antibody cocktails to be compared to. So that's the tortoise track, and that's going to be about five years. The hair track was because the NIH said, well, that's great, but what if there's an Ebola outbreak right now or somebody in the lab sticks himself with a needle? I mean, you have those two cocktails that work. Can't you just do something quick and dirty? And so the hair track is to take the six antibodies from those two best cocktails. We're not blinding them. We know exactly what they are. And we're just going to mash them up together in different ways and see if we come up with something better. And we're just going to do structure do in vivo and just see if we come up with something better. So I can show you the hair data. Now, I didn't collect it. I don't own the antibodies. This is done by Gary Covinger of the Public Health Agency of Canada, Gene Ollinger at USAM Red and Larry Zeit, and Matt Bio. So the one cocktail, MBO03, is those three antibodies right there. What they did to mash them together is to take 
those three components, these are, this is the mucin, mucin, glycan cap I showed you, and figure out of that set of three, which one was the best. So they put each of the antibodies individually, all by themselves, into primates. The two mucin ones didn't save anybody. The 13C6, the glycan cap, saved a third of the animal. So obviously that's probably the better one in there. So they took that antibody and they matched it together with the components of the other cocktail. So here's the other one, Zmab. These three entirely different antibodies and made it a bunch of different combinations. So Zmab one, two, and three. So the Z comes from here and MAP is because MAP bio is making MBO3. So they kept 13C6 constant and then they just did different sets of two of the other ones. And they put them all in animals to see, can we make something better? Now the first thing they did was to put them into guinea pigs at a very low dose, a suboptimal dose. They know at a good dose, both these cocktails save everybody. And if everybody lives, you haven't learned anything. And so they wanted to say, well, at a very low dose, can we get some partial survivor and distinguish, survival and distinguish these? Here's the parent, all the guinea pigs died at a low dose. Here's the other parent, one guinea pig lived at a low dose. So there's some room for improvement. Here are the three mashups, ZMAP1, 2, and 3. Kept 13C6 constant, swapped the other two. Different levels of survival, these two look the best. So ZMAP1 and ZMAP2 into macaques. And they did a high dose, 50 mg per keg, beginning at day three after infection. Now in a macaque, the disease course is that they all die around day seven or eight. So three is a, a good ways into that. They're starting to get sick. ZMAP1, they all lived. ZMAP2, five out of six lived. So they took ZMAP1 be plain ZMAP. And then they did the next experiment. Well, okay, this is right after infection. What if somebody were infected and didn't know about it, and then they just got a fever and a headache, and everybody assumed they had malaria because that's what's common, and then the malaria treatment didn't work, and then eventually somebody figured out they had Ebola virus? Or what if they knew they had been infected by Ebola virus, but it took a couple days to get them to the treatment or get the treatment to them, which is a quite real case scenario. So they wondered if they could extend the treatment window beyond three days. And they found that even at five days after infection, when the animals are all going to die at seven, you know, at five days, those animals are really sick. They could reverse the course of the disease and save all the animals. So this was tremendous. And this was the data that uh, was floating around the labs, unpublished, but being talked about at meetings. And then this happened. So... Samaritan's Purse missionaries. And the reason there was one dose is that that first dose was mobilized for a Sierra Leonean doctor. He was a national hero. He worked in the Lhasa ward. He was a truly, I mean, it, people say you cannot count one human life above another, but that human life actually was worth more than ours because he was the only doctor for miles around and he had trained everybody. He was infected from treating his patients. And so Many, many people moved heaven and earth to get this experimental therapy to him. By the time it got to him, he had started to develop his own immune response. And his doctors were worried that giving him an untested, extremely high dose of antibody could interfere with that some way. And so it was opted not to treat him with the experimental therapy. And he died. Um, I'm a PhD. I sit in La Jolla. I don't treat patients in Africa. Um, there's a whole different set of decisions there. But that dose was still in Africa when these two people became infected, and that's why one dose originally arrived for the two of them. It was already there, right? It, it took a couple other days to get more flow in there, but this one could just be driven. So doctor, missionary, medical worker, he got a pint of convalescent serum from a patient. She got ZMAP. A couple of days later, they both got another dose of ZMAP. And the reports we got... In had a miracle. So before they got the ZMAP, she was planning her, starting to plan her funeral, and he had called his wife to say goodbye. Um, and they were in really bad shape. And we started getting these reports that within an hour of getting this, this treatment, suddenly they were sitting up in bed and got up and walked and hadn't walked in a couple days, and their rash reversed. And this was really quite surprising to me. I mean, one hour, that 
that sounds like an antitoxin antibody, not an antiviral antibody. So there might be, but I, I, the, the doctors accurately reported what they saw, and this is an N of one. So we don't know whether this is a coincidence, a placebo virus, where some protein of it actually is functioning like a toxin, and one of these antibodies clean that up for some reason. Just, just to, we don't know. Anyway, the press went nuts talking about secret serum. It was three antibodies. And it wasn't even a secret. It was unpublished. Um, so if you'd been reading the Ebola antibody literature, you knew all about it. But they, they had not been reading the Ebola antibody <laughs> literature. And so there's a speculation of what is the secret serum. And it came out of the military. And oh my god, there's a, and big tobaccos involved. And, uh, <laughs> and so we had a couple of success stories. I mean, here's Dr. Brantley leaving the hospital, right? A couple weeks earlier, he thought it was over. So he's leaving the hospital getting high five. This is a British nurse that works in our field hospital that we collaborate with in Sierra Leone. He was infected. He got ZMAP in England, and he lived to tell the story. And here's a partial success. Uh, half of what was left was mobilized to Liberia and given to three doctors. Two of them had similar and they lived. The third one didn't. He had diabetes and hypertension. We don't know if this was a complicating factor. I mean, certainly, I think when H1N1 went through California, diabetes thing was associated with the people that didn't survive their infections. But we don't know. It's an N of three. And then we had some times where it didn't work. This Spanish priest, who was 75 years old, he had been infected for, I think, weeks by the time he got it. And see, so he may have been outside the treatment window. We don't know. The clinical trial hadn't been done yet, right? My skinny pigs, primates, the human trial was scheduled for 2015. So it hadn't happened yet, and that's why there were only a couple of human quality doses. And they hadn't done the trial where you figure out what should the dose be. And so they were just left in the position of, well, the monkey's got 50 mg per kg. Let's give humans 50 mg per kg. <laughs> How many more kilograms is a man than a monkey? 12 grams. Off you go. And so this clinical trial needs to be done to figure out what the, you know, what the dose ought to be and what the treatment window is, because you, know, you can argue um, if you've got a limited doses, you might save them for where they might be most effective. I don't know. Anyway, this poor gentleman, who is also kind of a hero, did not survive. OK, so what is this ZMAP? What does it look like, and how does it work? So remember, this was the hair track. It was just a bunch of stuff mashed together, worked in monkeys. The structures of half of them had knew they were called. We knew what 13C6 was, but we didn't know what the other two were. So we're doing this by electron microscopy, just to get a simple, quick read out of all of them. And this is the electron microscopist that collaborate with at Scripps, Andrew Ward. And this is the graduate student that we share. And this is ZMAP. So I'll show you what it is in a little more detail. So ZMAP is these three antibodies, 13 and these two parents. So let me show you the parent cocktails. This is the one. This is now a better image of 13C6. So the glycoproteins in white, that's the GP2 in white, the GP2 in black. 13C6 binds the very top, projects upward, anchors that glycan cap. OK. It, uh, if you remember, is cut off by cathepsin once it gets into the endosome. So it does not neutralize the virus. Neutralization means does it block entry. It doesn't block entry of the virus, but it's partially protective all by itself. And so it has to be recruiting immune effector function in some way by tagging the virus or infected cells in the immune system. The other two components of that parent cocktail are these mucin antibodies. They're also removed by cathepsins. They don't neutralize. And they, although they're effective in rodents, they didn't work in primates. So off they went. We kept this guy. This was mixed with the other two. Remember, there was a ZMAP 1, 2, and 3. So let's start at the bottom. ZMAP 3 had 1H3 and 4G7. Well, here's 1H3 and the light blue. So it also binds the glycan cap. It's lower in affinity, and it's a different angle. Um, so you can see how having these two together may not have been more efficacious than other cocktails, because it's two of the same thing, but this is not as good as that. They compete with each other. OK, let's go upward. Here's the other component of ZMAP3. This is 4G7. So it's different. It binds the base. It locks the GP1 and the GP2 together. 4G7 
is a neutralizing antibody. And in fact, that cocktail was picked on the basis of its ability to neutralize. So that's a different concept. Okay, what's the other one, the red one? It also binds the base. That's 2G4. So it also anchors the gray and the white together. And it's also a neutralizing antibody. Okay, so we have the ZMAP cocktail is the one against the top and two against the bottom. Well, here's the thing. They're against the same site, and they actually compete with each other. They're effectively kind of the same antibody. They come at it from different angles, but hit the same site. Now, it's possible that some would bind some GP molecules and the other one would bind the others, or some would bind you know, different monomers in the same trimer, but they are hitting the same site and doing the same thing. Of the two, we think 2G4 might be a bit better because a cocktail with 2G4 gives a little bit better survival than a cocktail that has the 4G7. So they look similar, but maybe the red one's a little better. Hard to say that the end wasn't real big. So here's the first thing we learn. This cocktail, which gives 100% protection, has two neutralizing antibodies against the base. So maybe neutralization was effective after all. But those kinds of antibodies look just like the ones against the base I talked about earlier. And in fact, if you superimpose them, they look really similar. So remember, this is the human antibody from the survivor that I showed you, the yellow one bound to the blue crystal structure. We're overlining with 4G7, and they bind to the same place at the same angle. So again, the crystal structure is human, the EM antibody is mouse. This is the anti-Sudan antibody. And so it has a slightly different angle, but we have two that come in horizontal, two that bind from the bottom. They have slightly different footprints, so they target slightly different spots on the GP. They have the same functional goal, but kind of different flavors arriving at the same solution. So these are now all the antibodies we have structurally mapped against Ebola virus. We have four now against the base, the two crystal structures, and the two from EM that are in ZMAP. We have two against the glycan cap, and we have two against the mucin-like domain. We know there's a whole bunch more against the mucin-like domain. We haven't structurally mapped them all because they don't seem that good. So there's three major sites. The ones against the bottom neutralize. So you bind something there, and you can prevent the virus from entering, probably by locking its machinery together. The ones against the top do not neutralize because they are cut right off in the endosome and the virus didn't care. It sheds that antibody and has a happy receptor binding site and is functional. So the assay of whether or not something neutralizes could be telling you something about where it binds. Certainly, antibodies against this site, and at least this one, seems useful in vivo, but you would never have picked it out by using an in vitro assay of neutralization. So, there's an argument here for putting a lot of different kinds of assays together to pick your antibody instead of only one. So ZMAP are these three. To remind you, there's the dark blue one against the top and the red and yellow stuck together. So now, knowing what we know now, still in the middle of the outbreak, here are the questions that I would ask. Was this a good idea to have two of the same thing? I mean, they're competing with each other. Is this a lost opportunity to put in something different? Or is what it's telling us something else? So, for example, are all these red, yellow, and orange antibodies against the same site the same thing, or are they different? Has one of them found some subtle variation in the epitope that's slightly more efficacious? Certainly, as the virus evolves and mutates, it might escape one rather than the other. The footprints are a little different, so you have the opportunity to kind of mix and match as the virus changes. But is one of these better than the other? And if so, we need to know why. So we're trying to solve the crystal structures to get the under, you know, understand what the molecular details are and understand if one neutralizes better than the other and, and why. Or the fact that this works, even though it has two of the same thing, telling us that the right formula is just one part top and two parts bottom. Doesn't matter what they are. And if that's true, maybe we should just pick the better one, the red one, and make the cocktail this. One part 13C6 and twice as much 2G4. Does this simplify the manufacturing if you're making two things instead of three? So by putting all this, or is it a lost opportunity? Instead of having two of the same, should we be looking for a new antibody against another epitope that could inactivate the virus some other way and have three different things? And maybe this would prevent escape even better. So what we're trying to do is we have all these labs now putting all our data together to try to answer these questions and figure out how to fight the virus. But in the meantime, ZMAP looks pretty good. And on a practical level, you could argue, well, what are you trying to achieve here? I mean, you already have 100% protection. Are you trying to give it 110%? <laughs> um, 
And the answer is that we, uh, there's always an opportunity to try to make something better or something at a lower dose or something that could uh, mitigate escape. I mean, that virus is happily mutating away out there. It would be really good to have, in addition to ZMAP, Plan B map. You know, what if the virus has escaped one of those? We could mix and match and come up with something else to come in and contain it. Okay. So we're, this has given us the kind of information that we need to do the roadmap for reformulation. Now, let me tell you my second story. Do I have time? Yeah, yeah. I think I have Okay. The second story is the viral matrix and how it gets out. Now, this is published, but it's so much more understandable in person than on paper. And I think it's really, I don't know, it's just, it's really compelling uh, as a structural biologist to see what proteins can do and what viruses have figured out how to do. So again, here's our cartoon of Ebola virus. It's got the GP we just talked about studied in the membrane. The protein layer under the membrane is called the matrix. This is not Keanu Reeves' matrix. This is the protein shell that, that gives the virus its shape. It makes the virus shell and interacts with the nucleocapsid in the center and the membrane on the outside. The protein that does this is called VP40, a system of viral protein that's 40 kilodaltons big. This is all you need to assemble and butt out things that look like Ebola virus. We call them virus-like particles because they're empty. They don't have the nucleocapsid the RNA. But you just transfect cells of VP40 and you butt out things that look exactly like Ebola virus all day long. So whatever there is in this protein is all you need to understand how to polymerize the shell and butt it out with its membrane into the right shape. So how does it do that? This was the first crystal structure saw the VP40 uh, 14 years ago now. In this crystal structure, they saw it had an N-terminal domain in blue and a C-terminal domain in orange. Okay, It was thought to be a monomer. But the interesting thing about a matrix protein is not what it looks like as a monomer, but how it builds, right? How does this thing oligomerize? How does it build a matrix? So it was noted that if you tinker with VP40, and the tinkering could be cutting off the C-terminal domains or incubating it in urea, you can coax VP40 to form rings. Here's EM of a hexameric ring. Here's the crystal structure of an octameric ring. This crystal structure was done by expressing the N-terminal domain all by itself without the C-terminal domain. Eight of them come together and make this Christmas wreath, and then, to their surprise, they saw RNA in the electron density map. A little three-nucleotide RNA, which turned out to be a stop codon. That's interesting. It could pick anything it wanted from the E. coli expression system, and it chose stop codon at the center. Okay, so this was the only model the field had for a decade for how the matrix assembled. And there's a world of literature in trying to um, figure out how this built a virus. And in fact, one of science's images of the year is an Ebola virus built from these little Cheerios. But there are a couple of problems with this model for viral assembly. The first one is that the rings do not exist in the virions. You can find them in infected cells, but they're not in the virion. So if they're not in the virion, they're probably not the virion building block. Okay, the second problem is that there's no RNA in the matrix layer in the virus. The RNA is bound to the nuclear caps in the core. There's no RNA in the matrix. So what this is, we didn't know. And the third thing is that mutations that prevent ring formation give you perfectly normal looking viral particles. Now the crystallographers that solved this were the ones that did this work. And so they did not think this was how the matrix assembled. It was just ahead of its time and they didn't know what it was yet. But the rest of the field proceeded as in, this is how Ebola virus assembles. Now, the scale is all wrong. You cannot make your filamentous virus by Cheerios stacked up. They're tiny. They're like little linoleum when the virus is this big. So that doesn't work. So there was kind of a, a remaining question for a couple of them about, well, how does it assemble if not that way? So we did not intend to do any of the work that I'm showing you. We thought the structure was solved, and we were working on something else. And we had just, were trying to make VP40 to pull down the something else that we were actually interested in. But the funny thing is that whenever we purified the VP40 we needed, it was the wrong size. It was a dimer, not a monomer. Now, we purified it a little more gently. We didn't add DTT, and we didn't add a fusion partner. And that's probably why we got the dimer. Um, and then we did something else in our lab. We did size exclusion chromatography coupled to multi-angle light scattering. So it's a much more sensitive method of molecular weight determining. And VP40 is just, it's a dimer. Naturally, in solution, it's a dimer, not a monomer. All right. So what? Well, 
we had all of this protein. We have these crystallization robots. And we'd been mildly interested in it before they could assemble some other way. So we took this bucket of protein, we threw it in the robots, it crystallized right away, diffracted right away. I think if it had been difficult at any step along the way, we might not have done any of the work I'm going to show you. We didn't know there's anything to be gained there because the structure was solved. So we solved the structure, and here it is. So here's the N terminal domain, here's the C terminal domain. This is the structure from protein known to be dimer. I'm going to overlay it now with structure from protein known to be monomer. They're the same. So the fold hasn't changed, and the revelation that the thing is a dimer hasn't told us anything new about how this thing is folded up. But it was a piece of information that we needed to go looking in the crystal packing. Because we knew the protein was a dimer, so somehow, in the way that the proteins come together to build the crystals, we should see that dimer interface. So let's look at the crystal packing. This is how the proteins form crystals, in this long filament. So the N-terminal domains are blue, the C-terminal domains are orange, and they're just organized like flip, flop, flip, flop, flip, flop, as they build the crystals. So one of these interfaces is the in-solution dimer. Is it where the N's meet or the C's meet? Well, the end-to-end -end interface buried a whole lot more molecular surface, so that was appealing. But the proof actually came from a point mutation we made there. If you mutate that leucine at the center, you get only monomer. So that's your dimer interface. This is your dimer. Shaped like a butterfly made from an end terminal domain interface. You see that helix at the center. So there's the dimer. All right? So what? Well, we wondered if that was important. Now, incidentally, that leucine is on the outside of the ring. It's got nothing to do with how you build the ring doesn't involve in any ring assembling interface. OK, so here's the filament. This is from the Sudan Ebola virus. Side view, roll it around. There's the top view. This is how the crystals are actually formed. Those filaments line up like this, like uncooked spaghetti strands all lined up parallel. So we wondered, well, this is VP40 assembling. Is this interesting, or is this just some artifact of crystal packing? Well, actually, it turns out we had all kinds of crystals. These belong to the space group C2. We also grew crystals from Zayer Ebola virus in P6422 and in P62, and this is the original structure solved 14 years ago. In every single one of these, VP40 has made the same filament. Sometimes they're rigid and they're parallel, and the crystals diffract well. Sometimes they're more floppy and they're twisty. So here's four twisted around each other into a narrow soda straw. Here's 10 twisted around each other into a tube. And so if you're a crystallographer, you pick the crystal that diffracts the best and you go with it. You would have lost a lot of that information. Luckily, we like to collect data on our crappy crystals <laughs> because we don't know what we're going to solve. And it was easy. We had all these crystals. They all gave up some diffraction of some kind. These were bad. They were four and a half. But anyway, you get the molecular replacement. You can see they all, every time you crystallize full length of B40, you get the same filament. Okay. So it looks like it's transcribed as a monomer. It builds this butterfly-shaped dimer. And then to build the crystal, da -da 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 -da, they assemble sideways into the filament. Every single time you've crystallized full length VP40, we get the same filament. Now, if you separate the N and C terminal domains by cutting off the C terminal domain or urea, you can get it to form a ring. And the ring is formed of all different interfaces and binds RNA at the middle. There's one structure of that. So here's a question we asked ourselves. Which of these builds the virus? And how would we know? Well, we saw that they were built by different protein-protein interfaces. So you see the yellow interface that builds the dimer and the filament is on the outside of the ring. And the interfaces by which these ends come together doesn't exist up there. And the surfaces that bind RNA don't exist up there. So you can make targeted mutations to try to knock out one interface or the other. OK, so this is now the end-to-end -end interface. So you're looking at the top of the butterfly. Here's the helices in the center. There's a threonine and a leucine that are important at the center. So if you mutate those, this is what you get. The wild type protein is a dimer. You mutate the dimer interface, you get a lot of monomer and a little bit of ring. That's interesting. So where do these proteins go in cells? So VP40 is green, track the green. The wild type protein traffics to the membrane and buds out these filamentous virus-like particles. So here's some in sideways, here's some in cross-section. If you mutate the dimer interface, it doesn't traffic so well the membrane, it doesn't bud anything at all. So it looks like it's important for it to be that dimer in order to make and bud a virus. So that dimer interface is essential. Even if you're still driving rings, you cannot bud a virus. OK, well, how about the filament? That's how the dimers come together. That's the crystal packing. Is that important? Well, the filament is made 
by the sea terminal domains interacting. And there, there's a methionine and an isoleucine that are kind of essential to the interface. So if you mutate those, this is what you get. So the wild type protein's a dimer. The first mutant's a dimer too. That's what we expected, because we mutated how the dimers come together. They should still be dimers. Wild type protein traffics to the membrane, buds out these little virions. It also buds out these little membrane ruffles. We don't know what they are, but it does that. The mutant doesn't traffic as well, but when it does get there, there's this crazy ruffling thing to the membrane. Uh, ruffles it like crazy. It doesn't successfully assemble and release a virion. We wondered what that mutant did, so we saw the structure. And what you can see is it's the same dimer. So here's a green butterfly and a blue butterfly. But instead of being packed by a straight-on interface, the mutation is made and packed by some kind of twisted, torqued interface. So maybe when it gets to the membrane, it's making some kind of twisted mess, which is causing that membrane ruffling morphology, but it can't build a virus. It's a thought. Anyway, that's what that mutant does. The other mutant is interesting. It does not make dimer. It makes exclusively ring. The wild type didn't really make exclusively ring. Um, and the rings bind RNA. The dimer doesn't bind RNA. The filament doesn't bind the RNA. EM of those little rings, they look a lot like the ones that the crystal structure was solved from. What does it do? It does not traffic to the membrane. It hugs the nucleus, and it doesn't bud anything at all. So it's found a different place it wants to be in the cell, and it does not make a virus. So it looks like disrupting filament assembly also prevents virus budding, even if you're exclusively driving rings. OK, well, what about that ring? Let's break it. So this mutation had been known for a long time in the field to prevent RNA binding and prevent ring assembly. Transfect cells. It's a dimer, just like wild type. Traffics to the membrane, buds out, virus-like particles, membrane ruffles. It looks just like wild type in assembly. Assembles and buds just fine. The little virus-like particles it makes are indistinguishable from wild type. So from that ex experiment, we conclude, well, maybe that dimer and filament has something to do with how you build a virus and not the ring. How different are the dimer and the ring? They're made from the same protein sequence. The answers are quite different. Natural protein is a dimer, easy to see, da 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 da, -da, -da simple sideways, you get a filament. To make the ring from the dimer, you have to separate the N and C terminal domains split the dimer interface, unravel the 70 amino acids that make it to expose a new surface. Then they rotate. Instead of being parallel, they become anti-parallel and backwards. Assembled by a new interface, the green interface, it used to be hidden by the C-terminal domain. Now, three of those anti-parallel backwards dimers then reassemble by that different RNA binding interface to make the ring, and the RNA binds at the center. So two different structures from the same polypeptide. Now, I'm going to save you about 20 minutes of <laughs> additional mutagenesis and structures to tell you that we think that this filament we captured in crystals is some kind of intermediate. We think this is what it looks like when it gets to the viral surface. There, there is a basic surface that interacts with the apical surface of the membrane. And you go and you mutate the surface and it doesn't interact. The BP40, this is now data from Rob Stahalen's lab in Notre Dame, actually, the C terminal domains, those orange ones, start to penetrate the viral membrane and cause a rearrangement into this different kind of hexamer. And this is now what we think is the building block of the virus. And that matches everything we know about virus assembly. So I can walk you through it later, but it takes about 20 minutes and there's a lot of mutagenesis. So just accept that you have two different versions of this thing. One where it makes this filament and rearranges to make this other zigzagging filament. And then you have this ring. You say, I believe. <laughs> OK, so what is that ring? <laughs> Is it anything? OK, remember this mutation that blocked RNA binding and ring formation. It assembles and buds virions all day long. They look exactly like wild type. This is a lethal mutation. You cannot propagate an Ebola virus through its whole life cycle bearing this mutation. Got nothing to do with virus assembly and budding. That's the main function of EP40. So why is this mutation lethal? The RNA binding ring must do something. It must be essential for something. The question is what? Well, while we were doing all this work, we discovered that VP40 has a second function in the virus life cycle, which is to control virus transcription. Well, maybe that's what the ring is for, right? Because the ring is the only manifestation of VP40 that binds RNA. It seems like binding RNA could be useful in controlling transcription. So now we have some new tools, because we've been monkeying around with all these mutants. We have Point mutants in VP40 that make only ring, and point mutants in VP40 that make never ring. So what do these look like? Now, you can't make a whole 
we have reverse genetics for Ebola virus, but you can't re rescue a virus with that mutation because it's a lethal mutation, it's dead. So we had to do this with a mini genome assay. An Ebola stop and a reporter you to see, can you read off, Ebola has is one long piece of RNA with every gene in a row. So we just wanted to see if you can get a reporter gene to operate using VP40. So wild type VP40 does it and you get reporter function. If you anchor VP40 into only making rings, you recover the function and you get a little more. So definitely the ring can do this transcriptional control function even a little better. If you prevent it from making a ring, you lose most of it, not all. There's some residual function. Maybe there's some partial structure. So it looks like this ring does have something to do with the transcriptional control. So you have this wild type polypeptide that without any post-translational modification, because we've done this all with protein from bacteria, it makes a dimer. I haven't shown you the data, but the dimer is essential for catching a ride up to membrane. It makes a filament to build and bud viruses, and it makes this ring to control transcription inside infected cells. The ring lives near the nucleus and actually appears first in viral infection, then uh, VP40 or dimers that trap a up and they make a filament and bud viruses. So the different things are in different places in the cell. Now here's the crazy thing about this. I mean, we've been looking at mutations of virus proteins. I mean, if you mutate the HIV capsid, you can make all kinds of structures. Um, but they are all mutants. They are not real. The wild type BP40 makes all these structures. It means to do them. We've seen viruses um, have differential splices, so they use different parts of the sequence to fold into different things. Well, that doesn't happen here. It's the same 370 odd amino acids that make all these different structures. There's no post-translational modification. Now, uh, phosphorylation could certainly happen in vivo, and it probably does, but we've been able to make all these structures from protein coming out of bacteria. So they're not essential to get it there. Um, they might play a role in an infected cell. What's happening is this is polypeptide is rearranging itself at different times to do different things. And they're all required. We've seen mutations make proteins have different structures, but they're wrong. These are all correct. The virus needs every single one of these. So what do you call a protein that does this? We went through a couple different names. We called it, we started with bistructural, but then it turned out there was three, and it sounded like a lifestyle. And so <laughs> we tried Ambiform, that turned out to be a glove manufacturer, and we finally settled on Transformer, which are these toys that refold from a robot to a vehicle. And what I really like about this analogy is that the robot and the vehicle obviously have different functions. Let's say one of them builds and buds a virus, the other one controls transcription inside infected cells. And it's the same plastic parts are in both, but they're assembled in different ways. So if you think of like the tires as like a secondary structural element, like an alpha helix or something, right? Here, they're obviously functioning as tires. They're helping VP40 carry cargo on the highway. Well, here... They're not that important. They're the seat and ankles of the robot's pants. And the robot's job is to walk and talk and shoot, whatever. Well, let's say you never knew this truck structure existed. And you're doing all your mutagenesis based on what you pull out of the PDB, which is the robot. And you decided to mutate the tires, and you lost the ability of the robot to carry cargo on the highway. You would think, he has rocket-powered pants. Or something. <laughs> So you'd make kind of the wrong conclusion. And it turns out that the robot's head is like the hydrophobic core that the engine block is folded around. So if you mutate the head, you lose both structures. And so you think, ah, oh, well, the head is obviously the thinking center when it turns out you've just wrecked the structure, but you didn't know. And so I like this analogy a lot, but um, the toy company did not want anything to do with Ebola virus. And they wouldn't let us use it. So we had to come up with something else. And my administrative assistant came up with this, molecular origami, where you think of the protein as a blank sheet of paper. So on the top, you see the dimer forming the ring. And on the bottom, you see the dimer. This is now the rearrangement as it interacts with the membrane to form the zigzagging hexamer that makes this long filament that builds and buds the viruses. So if you think about a polypeptide in its initial structure, it's this blank sheet of paper where you could fold it up one way and make one functional thing, or you could unfold it and refold it and do something else and make the zigzagging hexamer that builds and buds viruses. So it's kind of cool that we found this in a virus. And of course, it makes total sense that we found this in a virus, because viruses are under enormous selective pressure for economy of genetic information. These viruses, um, like Ebola viruses and a lot of other viruses, do not carry proofreading machinery. Uh, they're negative sense viruses. They have an RNA genome. They have to replicate their own RNA. 
Most mutations are probably going to be lethal. Some will confer advantage, but mostly lethal. But if most of your progeny won't live, there's kind of a mutational threshold. If you keep your genome below that limit, and that's sort of a compact genome, most of your progeny will survive. So they're under all this pressure to keep an economic little genome. And viruses do this a lot of different ways. They hijack host proteins. So HIV absolutely requires human cyclophilin to function, but it doesn't have to encode it. They encode proteins in overlapping reading frames. So the same piece of nucleic acid, but you read it in open reading frame one, it's one thing, and two, it's a different thing, and the third open reading frame is a different thing. So same piece of nucleic acid, different protein sequences. They have moonlighting proteins. There's all kinds of virus proteins that are known to have a, a job and a, and a night job or a moonlighting job. Often when we think about moonlighting proteins, certainly in the human genome, we think about their structures don't really change. They do one thing in one organelle, another thing in another organelle, or the top surface binds ligand X and the bottom surface binds ligand Y. This is a different flavor of that. Here's the fourth possibility that we see with EP40, is that the same polypeptide makes different structures for different functions at different times, and it needs them all. Um, it makes a lot of sense we found this in a virus, because viruses evolve so many thousand-fold faster than we do, right? You're replicating thousands of genomes of viruses in your one lifespan. Um, viruses could have happened upon this, but I don't, I mean, this is, there's nothing special about this being a virus protein. It's made from amino acids that stole from the human cell, linked together using the normal polypeptide machinery. This is something that proteins should be able to do. And I don't see why we won't find more of these if we're actually looking for them in the human genome. So, you know, I've always thought there must be some cancer where the protein was a different structure. So I could find it. So this is what we packed to go to the virus's territory. This is some of what we had schlep with us to go to Gabon. This is what the virus packs to come into our territory. And you know where I'm going with that. It's because it's not one tool. The viral proteins are actually many. So this is my group. And these are the people that did the work that I showed you. Marnie Fusco engineers all the viral glycoproteins for crystallization. Daphne Abelson did all the mutagenesis of EP40. Jeff Lee solved the first Ebola virus structure. Zach Bornholt solved the cleave structure and did all of the BB40 work. And it was actually Zach went from the gel where the thing was wrong molecular weight, and that's funny, to going down the rabbit hole and finding all the other data. So I give him all the credit for seeing what could be there um, in a structure. I mean, you might have looked at this project and said, this is a no-go. This is solved 14 years ago. What are you going to gain here, Zach? You know, but he saw it. Uh, uh, Daniel Murin did all the microscopy of the ZMAP antibodies, and Takao Hashiguchi works on a lot of glycoproteins and antibodies as well. So we collaborate with Gary Copinger at Canada, Larry Zeitlin to come up with all these antibodies, Andrew Ward helps us with the electron microscopy, Yoshihiro Kawaoka's lab did all the microscopy of the transfected and infected cells to traffic VP40 around. And our support comes from a NIAD and the Burroughs Welcome Fund. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so everybody, um, there was one, the, the first Christmas where everybody I'd ever hired was still.